Thank you very much for asking me to speak. It's a great pleasure to be here at the Australian Space Biology Health Symposium. I'm Bill Morgan. I'm one of the clinician scientists and managing director of the Lion's Eye Institute in Perth, Western Australia. We've been working on cerebrospinal fluid pressure or intracranial pressure for many years. And we've become recently interested in space-associated neuroocular syndrome. Spaceflight-associated neuroocular syndrome, or SANS, was first noted in 2005 with features similar to idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Subjects develop swelling of the choroid and in particular swelling of the optic nerve with retinal flattening but tend not to get headaches or tinnitus that is ringing in the ears. And it's related to being in space for 30 days or more with some 60% or 50% of astronauts who are in space for more than six months developing definite signs. And it's not just restricted to the eyes. Uh, recently MRI scans have shown brain changes with ventricular enlargement. It's currently one of NASA's top four health priorities for long-term space missions, along with radiation, behavioural decrement, and food and nutrition. So SANS occurs in more than 50% of astronauts in long-term space flights. This MRI scan shows swelling of the subarachnoid space filled with CSF fluid at the very back of the eye, because the subarachnoid space surrounds the optic nerve from the brain to travel right up against the back of the eyeball but it's not usually so distended. This distension is causing pressure on the back of the eye and flattening of the retina with pressure particularly in the optic nerve which is the softest part causing it to go from a flat type of structure in this example of an astronaut photograph taken before flight to a swollen pushed forward structure in this astronaut, same astronaut, uh, photograph taken on return to Earth. Additionally, in a group of four astronauts, lumbar punctures have shown an elevation in CSF pressure of between 21 and 28 millimet centimetres of water when the normal range is 15 to 20. Which is still got about three and a half this months to go with many, many uh, science projects and payloads ahead of us, uh, several spacewalks planned, uh, some arm operations, many things that are running the whole gamut. So it's, a, it's an exciting time and a time to be thankful for being here. And, I, and, and one other thing before I close, you know, you think about space flight, at least I did when I was a kid, and the thing you think about is being weightless and the opportunity to just float effortlessly. You know, I can I can do a uh, I can do a my bat imitation. So now we would love to be able to measure the cerebrospinal fluid pressure in astronauts in space, but the only way of doing that currently on Earth or anywhere is to either insert a long needle into the back and tap into that fluid, or drill a hole in the head and put a cannula right into the centre of the brain into the ventricles or a transducer into brain tissue. Clearly all of these procedures are quite invasive and have particular risks. What we noticed about seven years ago in our research is that the brain acts as a pulse wave generator in time with the heartbeat and sends a pulse wave along the retinal veins from the optic nerve into the eye we can actually sample these pulse waves and their characteristics give us information concerning the CSF pressure from the pulse wave generator. That noise was the pulse oximeter in time with the pulsation of the optic nerve or the centroidal vein pulsation. What we can do is take fast video trains of the back of the eye and we can use the green colour channel, which is maximally absorbed by haemoglobin, and look at the intensity over time at each point on those frames after alignment. And this is a typical 
uh, pulsation, the three cardiac cycles, of one particular point on of this particular retinal vein. This is another point pulsating in this particular retinal vein. And the mathematical algorithms we've devised calculate the amplitudes using Fourier analysis at each point. And we can then select maximum amplitudes from the retinal veins. Now, the technique involves currently using a 100 kilogram slit lamp camera, which has been modified, contact lens on the eye with a force transducer so that we measure the force and then know what intraocular pressure we're applying along with the pulse oximeter to gate the cardiac cycle. Typical output includes the fact that we take multiple sequence of video trains at multiple intraocular pressures and we can calculate the amplitudes on this graph here in the retinal veins at various intraocular pressures Typically, we get curves which look at either like this or like this. Now, from an engineering perspective, we're actually modelling what's called a Starling resistor or a flow discontinuity fluidic system. And what we're interested in is the pressure at the exit, so where the downstream from the veins. And it's been shown that the regression of the rising phase of the amplitudes as it intersects the x-axis, theoretically should coincide with the downstream pressure. This is an example of a patient who had normal CSF pressure. Here you can see the swollen optic nerve in a patient with elevated CSF pressure, and you can see how the intersect is much higher. This is just an example of the physiology we've discovered, showing how the curve literally shifts left and right, as well as changes its shape overall. What we're interested in is this rising phase of the curve, which then is extrapolated to the x-axis. If the CSF pressure is too low, then most of that rising phase of the curve is lost, so we can't do the extrapolation. So the technique really works only in elevated, uh, sort of, elevated normal CSF pressure to elevated CSF pressures. So those really above 15 centimetres of water or 15 millimetres of mercury. These are the results. And here you can see the estimated CSF pressure by this, what we call photoplethysmography technique, compared to the gold standard CSF pressure measured either by lumbar puncture or EVD. Now only two of our subjects in, uh, out, out of the 30 had EVDs. Uh, all of the others had lump punch, lumbar puncture measurements. You can see that there's a strong relationship, high correlation coefficient, a slope that's virtually one. What's more important from a clinical perspective in terms of accuracy is whether the differences between those two techniques vary greatly. Here we've plotted a Bland-Altman plot, which is the difference between the two measurements uh, on the x and the y-axis and the mean of the two measurements on the x-axis. And you can see that most of the measurements fall within plus or minus 5 millimetres of mercury, 94% in fact. The mean absolute difference was about 3 millimetres of mercury. And it's difficult to know whether this is good or bad. However, if one compares the two gold standards with themselves, that is EVD versus lumbar puncture, this is the graph on the lower right. And you can see it's not too dissimilar to our particular graph. So there, 95% of differences were between minus 5 and 2.6. Ours was between minus 5.3 and 3.9 millimetres of mercury. So we're probably not too far removed from the best possible situation comparing two gold standards. Now, do we think that we've got sensitivity to detect change in CSF pressure? That's essentially what we would be hoping to do amongst astronauts. 
we did some crude tilt table experiments. Now, the problem with our system is that the head has to be in a vertical position, cannot be lying down for the system to work. We don't, the slit lamp camera won't work unless it's in a vertical position. So here we have a subject sitting, subject lying down. However, her head is in the vertical position. What we've done is we've measured the hydrostatic or the vertical height difference at the level of T1 to the eye. T1 happens to be the hydrostatic indifferent point on average in humans. So we've calculated that for each posture and then calculated a difference to estimate the change in CSF pressure when the posture has changed. And these are the results. The blue bands are the sitting posture, the red is lying down. And generally speaking, you can see that the blue was higher than the red, which is what one would expect because the CSF pressure is lower and the pulsation amplitudes, and I forgot to mention what the box plots actually are, they're the sum of the pulsation amplitudes in the retinal veins for those particular subjects. So it's, the blue is the median result there, which tends to be higher in the sitting posture because CSF pressure is lower due to sitting up. If you plot the difference in amplitudes between the two postures, the mean difference, and the mean CSF pressure difference in the two postures calculated using that hydrostatic indifferent point measurement, then you get a rough linear function, which is encouraging. Also, you can see that perhaps you might say that this is perhaps the threshold at which a genuine difference can be detected which coincides at about 5 millimetres of mercury. So it looks like a system might be able to detect a 5 millimetre mercury change in uh, CSF pressure. So CSF pressure is probably important in space. It's almost certainly driven by venous pressure, general fluid shifts, potentially um, lymphatic pressures because some of the CSF drainage occurs via the lymphatics in the orbit and elsewhere. It can't be measured in space and in fact on Earth it's a very invasive measurement to do this so it'd be difficult to convince astronauts to have lump punctures routinely or especially EVDs. So and also CSF pressure is quite strongly linked to SAM so understanding this is going to be important for understanding and potentially treating or monitoring the treatment effects for SAMs. We're currently working on a portable system which will be much smaller and ideally handheld uh, to combine the key components and ideally this could be used in space and it, on Earth it could have very large applications in the health domain, particularly in patients who've had head injuries, stroke, intracranial hemorrhages and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So it's a fascinating and exciting area. We're particularly excited about the ability we may have to apply physiological insights to direct uh, application for use in space and on Earth. Thank you very much for listening to me.